Take your Bibles, if you would, today, and turn to the book of John, chapter 17. The title of this morning's message is, Jesus' Prayer for Us. Now, we're going to be taking a look at John 17, verses 20 through 26. And I haven't asked this question in a long time, but why are we reading verses 20 through 26? It's next. It's next. Exactly right. And by the way, I wanted to let you know, uh, I think that after, with the first Sunday of 2023, wow, 2023, that we're going to go through a book I have never taught, I've never preached, um, is probably one of the most, I mean, where, how do you say this? Um, it's a significant book in Christian history, of course, and that would be the book of Romans. So I would ask you to start now reading the book of Romans. Take your time. Don't read fast. And when you get through all 16 chapters, you know what I want you to do? Start over. And at least read it one, maybe two times um, before we start the series. We begin this series back in John chapter 14, verse 1. This section of scripture from chapter 14 through 17 are Jesus' final words to the apostles before he was arrested, tried, and crucified. In chapter 14 and verse 1, his first last words were these. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Everything he said from that point forward was designed specifically to prepare them for what, lied, what lay ahead for them as believers and uh, proclaimers of the gospel. The only section of this that we're looking at, that we have looked at, that does not apply directly to the apostles are verses 20 through 26, which is what we're going to be looking at today. I want us to, uh, I guess I need to take my Bible and turn to John chapter 17, I want us to read this particular passage uh, beginning in verse 20. Jesus is praying. Remember, this is all, the whole 17 is the prayer of Christ. Verse 20, Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, he's talking about the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I am them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that, the, that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. We're going to look at this particular paragraph in three sections. The first section is going to be who Jesus prays for. Now look at verse 20. Here's what we read. 
I do not ask for these only, he's talking about the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. This is an echo of chapter 17 and verse 9. It's right there in front of you. You can just back up and see it where Christ says, I am praying for them, talking about the apostles specifically. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. This means that Jesus' prayer was not random. It was not general in a certain way. It was very specific. And Jesus' prayer in these two verses, verse 20 and also chapter 17, verse 9, are very difficult for many people to hear and process and believe. And the reason is because they think that it is exclusive in a way that they can't understand. And it is exclusive because Jesus says, I'm praying for these guys right here. I'm not praying for the world. And then in the section we're looking at today, Jesus says, I'm not just praying for these guys right here. I'm praying for those who will believe. Now, who does that leave out? Leaves out unbelievers. And that's where people start kind of having a little bit of an issue. And I would like to suggest that it is not difficult because of what we find back in chapter 14, verse 1. Because Jesus says that you believe in God, believe also in me. Now that just doesn't mean the persona of God or the person of Jesus. It means who God is, who Christ is, completely, all without exclusion. Now, now this is going to be very important, what I'm about to say. But when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to theology, when it comes to life, it behooves us to believe God. You'd think that would be easy. But one of the things that I have had to do myself, and you'll see it as we continue to go through this morning, is when I run into passages like this where Jesus says, I pray not for the world, but for those whom you have given me, I don't try to do theological gymnastics with it. I'm one of those, and I have a, a member of my family who is much like this, that moves to a simplicity of faith and belief. In other words, there are passages in Scripture that rather than having them uh, really get into my heart and spirit and cause me trouble, I just say, I believe it. It's God's word. And I, it's not my place to question God when he proclaims truth. Now, I will tell you that when it comes to believing God, the John 14, 1 passage, I believe that it is not just for events or situations. It is for our life. It is for theology. And it is for doctrine. In other words, believing God and Jesus means believing their word, which means the scripture. Now, I'm going to be honest. There are passages that I have and still do struggle with. In fact, there are passages a lot of people struggle with. If you are a growing Christian, there will be times in your life that as you read the scripture, you're going to struggle because the Bible is not always easy to understand. Some people struggle with the passages of homosexuality. That one is huge right now because of the gay movement trying to say that Scripture does not condemn them. Uh, people will struggle over alcohol and race and baptism, eternal damnation, salvation in Christ alone, and even eschatology, and it can go on and on and on. But I want you to, if you take notes, write down this passage. Because here's what Paul told or wrote to Timothy, which I think is, is uh, applicable to us. It's 2 Timothy 2.15. Let me just read it for you. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul wrote, Do your best. 
Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, one who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, what that means is that you can't just take a verse of scripture and build a whole life theology on it without putting it in context and understanding what is being uh, said in line with other passages that provide commentary on a passage. Without scripture or with scripture, the question that we are to ask is this. It's been a long time since I've said this, but when it comes to the Bible, we are to ask ourselves this question and answer it. What does it mean? Not what does it mean to you? Or what does it mean to me? Or what does it mean to our little group? But what does it mean? I think that if we would, as a Christian family, have that as our goal rather than than affirming what we say our doctrine and beliefs are, and you know that can go all over the place, to instead seek God's truth and say, God, what does this mean? And then to embrace that. I will tell you this, there is nothing in the Bible that will hurt you. There are some things in the scripture we may not like at times, but I promise you God puts nothing in his word that can hurt us. So, we're to believe God, and we're to believe his word. And even though there are times when it's hard, that is where our faith in believing God happens. So when Jesus excludes a group, those who won't believe, and prays specifically for those who, you, who will believe, and also if you look at it close, he said, those whom you have given me, which implies that there are some that God doesn't give Christ. And that's where the rub comes in for us. But I want us to, to realize that those passages, those phrases, do not contradict what Jesus said elsewhere, such as, well, let me ask you a question. Can anyone be saved? Yes. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How does that fit with John 17? I don't know. Because there are things in John 17 that I can't reconcile with other passages. So you know what I do? I believe them both. And people say, well, that's contradictory. No, it's not. God wrote it. God doesn't contradict himself. Let me ask you this. Or think about Acts 16, 31. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you might be saved? No, you will be saved. In Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls, how many? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who God saves, and catch this, I want you to get it. Because yes, we're talking about, to a degree, predestination, election, the sovereignty of God. Yes, though, that's the, the context that we're in. But I want us to understand something, that who God saves, that's his business. Our business is to proclaim the gospel. We don't save anybody. We proclaim the gospel. So I want us to see who Jesus prays for in this group. And because I think I know everybody here, that means that Jesus was not just praying for you as everybody who would believe. I think he he, being divinity, he could, in a nanosecond, think through the person and name and life of every person who would believe, and that's who he prayed for. Which means that on this time, in this prayer, Jesus prayed for us individually and specifically. I don't know about y'all, but I like that. To know that the Christian faith is not just something that is for everyone, it's for me. And that the death of Christ is not just for everyone or all who would believe. It's for me, personally. Now, I want us to look at 21 through 23.
Because when Jesus prays, it is for every believer, which means all relationships, which means one-on-one, -on -one, it means family, all believers, by race, class, age, male, female, you name it, he prayed for us. Now look at verse 21, and, and let's slow down and look at what Jesus prayed. We know who, now let's look at what. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. Guys, that ought to cause us to stop and, and take a breath and just meditate for a minute to see that Jesus is praying for us to have interrelationships as brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of anything else, politics, anything else, that we are to be one in the same way and degree that Jesus and God the Father are one. And not only that, that as they are in each other, that they are in us. And we've talked about before, that the Trinity, the Trinity abides and lives in the life and heart and soul and spirit of believers. And it's not that we aren't alone because God is beside us. It's that we're not alone because he is in us. Keep reading verse 22 or, or the last part. Now, now, why does he pray this in verse 21? so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In other words, the way Christians interrelate with each other has an impact on whether or not Jesus Christ is the Son of God and whether or not God sent him and the purpose for which he was sent. So does it matter how congregations interact with each other? Tremendously. We're going to follow into that here in just a moment. Look at verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Why? That they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Why? Look at this. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you love me. I mean, think about this. God, Jesus is praying here for us to love each other in such a way that the world knows that Jesus is loved by God the Father and that God the Father loves Jesus. Jesus loves us and we all love each other and that we're all one. Now, now that, that to me... <laughs> means more than I can get to. I've, I've, I've had to rewrite this several times. That, that little phrase that they may be one means one in spirit, in belief, in thought, in attitude to each other, relationally, in every way you can realize or think of Christians are to be loving of one another, are to be accepting of one another, are to support one another, are to be a part of one another so that we are one. Listen, I, one of the greatest, well, no, I'm going to get to that in a minute. I forgot. Forget that phrase for just a second. I'm just, it didn't happen. If I could, I'd edit it out, but I don't know how. <clears throat> Jesus prayed for unity among all who would believe. Here's a big point, big point. God works in every believer now, then, in the future to answer the prayer that Jesus prayed right here. It is something that God is continuing to do because here's the way it happens. All believers will, by the power of God, grow in unity with the Trinity with other believers 
and in the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so what we are seeing this morning is that the unity of believers is a proof of God's work in them, which means salvation. In other words, we don't just come to church on Sunday to worship God. Yes, we do that. But it is also to, to strengthen the bonds that we have with each other and also the bonds we have with God. And it doesn't stop outside this congregation. If a person is a believer in Jesus Christ, they are our brothers or sisters. And we are to love them unconditionally with forgiveness, with reconciliation, with uh, support, with prayer, all the things, because we are to see each other. You know, one of the things that I like about being a Christian is I have siblings. In the world, I don't. I have a little brother that I'm going to get to see in heaven. I have a, a child that... Uh, uh, we're going to get to see one day. But I have y'all as my brothers and sisters in Christ. And that means that we have a, a very special bond and relationship. One of the things that has bothered and troubled me most through the years is to see, as it's usually, it usually happens at funerals, families that are divided. I don't understand how that can happen. Well, I guess I can. Um, but I, I don't want it to happen in the family of God. And we're going to talk about that again in just a moment. I have quoted this next section of three verses so often that I want you to hear it today in a different context. The unity of believers, the love for one believer for another, is the continuing work of God in answer to the prayer of Jesus from John chapter 17. Now here's the way it sounds in Paul's words. He who began a good work in you, huh? he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That means he's going to make that work in us. Talking about love and unity. Philippians 2.13. God works in you both to will and work for his good pleasure. You know what God's good pleasure is? The unity of believers in the faith. To know the love of God. To love each other. To let the world know that Jesus is real because of how we are interrelated. And that leads us to Romans 8.29 which those whom he foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those three verses that I've used multiple times are direct answers to how God is carrying out his answer to Jesus' prayer about unity. The unity of believers has a result. Look at verse 21. You should be in chapter 17, verse 21. Is it leads people... To believe in God sent Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, I know what those people are like down there at that church. I ain't never going. Well, you know, they've had several splits. You know, if that's what being a Christian is like, I don't want to be it. And what Jesus is saying here is that in his prayer, believing and loving each other brings to people an affirmation that the Father sent Jesus as an act of love to, sal to salvation. Now, this weekend, I got to thinking back and meditating, which is what happens when you read the Scripture. You think of a lot of things, and I would like to believe that it's the Holy Spirit. But guess who has heard that prayer? Who heard that prayer that night? Who has heard it every time it has been read and has read it more times than we ever could if we read it every day of our life? Satan. I think Satan heard that. 
And I think that he was listening to that prayer of Jesus about the unity of the faith, about the people of God being one, and he thought, aha, that's going to be my point of attack. I think he saw it as a way to undercut the gospel in the church and to hinder the gospel through the disharmony and disunity in congregations. How does he do that? He sows tares among the wheat, which is why it's important as to who is allowed to be a member of the local congregation. We'll go there some other day. He has put wolves among the sheep, sometimes even in the pulpit itself. He sends false prophets and causes division wherever possible. You read the New Testament, you're going to read these very things. You look back through church history, you're going to see every one of these things because bickering and fussing and fights in congregations are stumbling blocks about Christianity and people worshiping at a local fellowship. In fact, if you read that, don't Turn in there. But in Acts 2, 42 through 47, the, uh, Luke writes about how the early church was one. They had all things together. I mean, they, they met together for prayer and fellowship and the Lord's Supper. They were one. But it wasn't long after that that everywhere the gospel took root, there was division and there was also problems. I couldn't help but go further. Every congregation except Calvary Missionary Baptist. Say amen. amen. You don't know what I'm going to say yet about y'all, but say amen. Every congregation except here had problems. Significant problems. Every congregation, y'all already know this, except one fired the pastor prior to me and several of them split with every congregation having people leave because of disharmony and unity and all different kinds of things. Every congregation I know has had divisions and people leaving for one or another reason to another congregation or to start a new one. Calvary is the only congregation I've served that doesn't, do you hear me, doesn't have problems in the fellowship. I like that. That's a blessing to me. Because you see, this is how Satan works. And he has had success to a degree. But in every congregation, let me tell you something else. And not, this is every congregation. I have known precious mother, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Every single one of them. Without exception. There have been people who had a spirit that was gracious and kind. They loved God. They loved the local congregation. They loved the church universal. They loved other believers. They were of one mind who named Jesus as Savior. And because of them, I think of John, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Satan can try, but the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Those are the words of Jesus, Matthew 16, 18. In reality, Satan cannot divide the church. Amen. Remember something. Let's get our terminology right. This is Calvary Missionary Congregation. There's a difference between the church and a congregation. A congregation is where a lot of people are. The church, notice I use the word the, the church is universal. Every person who is a believer is a part of the church. But not every congregation has everyone who is a believer, but every believer will be part of a congregation. Did y'all get all that? Because that is important for us to keep in mind that Satan can really only... Ooh, I'm going to say it this way. The only people Satan... Ooh, 
Y'all, look, I'm relying on scripture because of what I said the first. The only people Satan can get to are those that Jesus didn't pray for. Remember, he said, I pray not for the world. I pray for those who will believe. So guess what? Jesus' prayer to God, do you think God would say, oh, well, you know, couldn't help it on that one. I tried, but, you know, they, that, I just couldn't. They were stronger than me today. I, maybe, maybe I'll pull in a couple of extra angels next quarter, and we'll see what we can do. That's not the way it works. God never loses, ever. So what happens is congregations make the mistake of accepting anybody who wants to be a, a member of that congregation right on in. I'm telling you, I have said, y'all remember the book? Who sits in pew number seven? That's right, the devil in pew number seven. That's in more churches than we can realize. Don't forget Matthew 16, 18. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Last point. Jesus' prayer continues to be answered today. Look at chapter 17 of John, verse 26. And believe me, there's a lot in this I, I didn't, I'm, I'm having to skip over. But Jesus says in John 17, 26, these words as part of his concluding thoughts in his prayer. I made no, known to them. Now, who's the them? Those who believe. Those who will believe. No, it's those who believe. No, it's the apostles. Yeah, I got to get my timing right. Got to get my timing right. He says, I made known to them your name. He's talking about the apostles there. And look, and I will continue to make it known. Now, who's that? That's us. And I will continue to make it known. Why? That the love with which you've loved me may be in them and I in them. And here's what is so cool to me as I'm thinking about this is that Jesus prayed for us then and he has still been praying for us since he ascended to heaven. How do I know that? Because of Romans 8, 34. Christ Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, is interceding for us. It means Jesus hadn't quit praying. And by the way, God answers Jesus' prayers perfectly. And unity among believers is a perfect prayer that God carries out and works every single time. Now, does it take work? Yes. Do you know why God put us in families? I've said, I don't know if I've said this here. God put us in families to learn to love unlovable people. And I'm talking about them in relation to you. Okay? A church is a family. Are we going to have disagreements long enough? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. I've never been able to get this, you know, to work this. That if there is a problem or a difficulty, we're not, I'm not going to leave. And, I, and you're not going to leave and take your Bible and go home. We're going to get together. We're going to sit down. We're going to work it out. Do you know why? Because that's what Jesus prays for. He prays for unity among the body of Christ. But in too many times, we're like little kids that if we don't get our way, when's the last time y'all saw a kid throw a hissy fit? This week. This week? Yeah, we were with our grandkids. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I made the mistake one time. <laughs> God, I can't believe I said this from the pulpit. But I was talking about unity and people getting along. And I made something similar to this statement here. Some of y'all are acting so immature. The best thing I think I could do is to get a big pacifier and put it in your mouth. Right as I said that, I thought the Spirit did not inspire that. But you know what? To a great degree, that's true. 
And to a great degree, what I've got to decide is you all are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I am not going to let by the power of God and the will of God not let anything or anyone come between us. Why? Because it goes right to the glory of God. It goes right to the point of whether or not Jesus is who he said he is and if God is who he says he is. So, there is an attitude and spirit of unity among God's people that cannot be denied. It is obvious to be from faith to faith among believers. Satan cannot overcome the power of God. So I want to tell you something. I, this is my concluding thought. Calvary, I thank God for y'all. Man, I do. The one thing I want me more than anything else in my ministry from this point to whenever Jesus takes me home is for there to be peace. I've had enough of that other junk and I don't like it. There is peace and unity among Calvary because God is answering his son's prayer here. And I also believe that God is working in each of you to affirm that in your salvation. Let's pray. Father, I, I feel woefully inadequate to pray anything more than what your son prayed in chapter 17. And I'm thankful that you can work in us and are working in us to accomplish your son's prayer. Father, help us <coughs> that we may work toward that ourselves, whether it's with situations in the past or whether it's present or what may happen this week, so that we do not give a reason for stumbling to those who are evaluating the validity of the Christian faith based on our words and conduct. Bless each of your people, Father, who are here today and those who cannot be with us. And may you be glorified in all things. In Christ's name, amen. What channel? Channel? 837. Channel 837. Let's all stand. <laughs>